In my hand here, I have the AMD Ryzen 5 5600G. I absolutely love this CPU. It was a really great option, especially when we had a GPU shortage. You could easily get up and play some 1080p games and it was ready for when you wanted to slot in a graphics card at a later date. Now, I actually did my first build tutorial with this CPU. I can actually find it on the channel still if you want to check that out. Now, a couple of years later, we now have the AMD 8000 series. AMD and also Scan Computers UK very kindly sent these out for me to look at. They are a UK retailer that sells a whole host of different components. They have their 3XS pre-built systems, some pro audio video gear, anything technology wise, they're a really good place to go and I'll link them down in the description. So a couple of the key things I want to cover just quickly between the 8000 series before we get into the box. These have the built-in M processor like you'd see on the laptops, for example. They do have different ones depending on the tier you go for, and we'll cover that as we go throughout the video. But they basically include the graphics that you need to get up and going with 1080p mid, low. We will, of course, test them to the maximum potential. But you can just do some gaming straight out of the box. Plug straight into the back of the motherboard, and you don't need to add a graphics card, which can be great, especially if you may be saving up and you want to get on and do a little bit of gaming while you're saving up for that graphics card slot in later or if you're maybe building a system just to work from home and you want to do it on a bit of a budget, this can be a great way to get some graphics in there without needing to add an additional graphics card, which can obviously be quite expensive. The second thing is that the 8000 series only supports up to Gen 5 for graphics and storage. I don't really think that's going to be a problem though, because Gen 4 is a real nice sweet spot. It's not like when we had the Gen 3 limitation on the 5600G, where there was a real big change from generation to generation. But now Gen 4 is so fast and affordable, I really don't think it's going to be a problem there anyway. So let's get into the nitty gritty and talk about the cores and the clocks of these processors. On the left hand side, we've got the 8500G, which will be a 6 core and 12 thread processor. We have got a 3.5 gigahertz base clock and then a 5 gigahertz boost clock. This is using the AMD Radeon 740M graphics. This will retail for $176. In the middle, we've got the Ryzen 5 8600G. This is a 6 core 12 thread again with a little bit of a bump on the base clock up to 4.3 gigahertz, and then a boost of five gigahertz again. This one's using the Radeon 760M graphics and will retail for 229. Then we have the top of the stack, which is the Ryzen 7 8700G. This is an eight core 16 thread processor. We have a 4.2 gigahertz base clock and a 5.1 gigahertz boost clock. And that's using the Radeon 780M graphics, which will retail for 329. So quite a lot of waffle at the start, but I wanted to give you all the key specs and things you needed to know. Now let's get into the box. So all out of the boxes now, and as you can see, they do all have an included cooler, which is a nice little bonus. I will test all of these with the included coolers as well, so you can get an idea of what you could expect if you're gonna run one of these at home. All of these have got a pre-applied thermal paste on the back. I'll use this with the processors too, so I'm not, I'm not gonna change anything about it. I'll keep the same thermal paste as well. When it comes to the Ryzen 7 Spire, a little bit thicker than the other two, but it does have an additional two cores and four threads. These are all a standard four pin header as well for PWM control. I think it's really nice that you can run these with the stock coolers. That's one thing I've always liked about the G series. Don't run very hot, so you can use them with these. And then again, saves you extra money in the long run as well. So just putting these to the side to talk about the test system. I would usually use my graphics card test bench, but that is on the AM4 platform. So of course we're gonna to have to change things a little bit for AM5, but I'm gonna be using the Asus Tough Gaming B650 Plus Wi-Fi. I've already covered this on the channel if you wanna check it out, but it's a reasonably priced board, something you'd like to expect to be pairing with one of the APUs anyway. Then we're going to be using a Samsung 980 Pro, which is a Gen 4 one terabyte NVMe. This is a really great price performance drive, so something that you'd likely use with one of these processors anyway. Then last but not least, I've got a 32 gig of Kingston Fury Beast DDR5. These are 5200 mega transfers and CAS latency 40. No RGB as well, so at the time of recording on Amazon, they're a more affordable kit, so I've tried to keep it a bit more budget orientated. So we'll get this all put together and then get testing these CPUs. I'm really looking forward to these. So let's uh, get onto the graphs and see what kind of performance they give. Sorry about the tone of my voice is a little bit lower. I've lost my voice a little bit since I recorded the intro, but I have tested all the CPUs and I've got a lot to talk to you about. So I've put all the parts into the Corsair 4000X, which is my usual cooler test system. All of the fans are at 1600 RPM with fan speed reducers. So it's nice and consistent for all the thermal tests. I did swap the NVMe drive to the Seagate Fire Cooler 530. Motherboard just didn't like the Samsung one, but that still is a drive that's at a recommended or a hot seller on Amazon anyway. I also turned stamp off between each change of the CPU, which is recommended for this motherboard and the CPU combo, and then also enabled DOCP, so the memory is running at 5200 megatransfers per second. 
Uh, to test the CPUs, I ran 10 tests. Some focused on the CPU, some focused on graphics, some did a bit of both. And then I put them in through my spreadsheets and then made some graphs I could usually see from my GPU results. First of all, I've got four tests that are free to download. So should you wish, you can download these and then test your systems to compare. We've got 3D Mark, which is a free demo on Steam, Geekbench 5, Blender Render Test and Cinebench R23. As expected from the core and clock changes, we see an incremental change throughout all of the tests over the different CPUs, with a very nice jump on the CPU score when it comes to the 8700G. Well, those two extra cores and four threads make a lot of difference. Moving on to gaming, I've used five of my usual benchmarks games and also added another which I feel will be more suited to a case like this. Starting off with Apex Legends using 1080p low, even on the 8500G, we see a pretty usable 56 FPS average and a steady increase throughout the SKUs. If you're used to 60 FPS console gaming, then you'll certainly feel at home here. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Dirt 5 low presets, the APUs do struggle to get close to the console frame rates, especially in Tomb Raider, but they do give very consistent frame rates. Additionally, these are two games in the lineup that don't offer anything like FSR or frame gen. So the game I added to this suite this time around was Valorant, a very popular title, and thanks to its art style means it's rather easy to run. In the shooting range, I managed to get onto high settings without any issues, and even the 8500G managed a great frame rate that felt very smooth. Now it is worth saying that even though the minimum and the 1% lows are drastically different to the averages, it didn't feel like that as I was playing. Now that being said, I did use the shooting ranges, that was something I could recreate easily between runs. So in multiplayer, you might need to drop the settings down a little bit. The last two games are by far the most intensive, the first being Starfield, which is one game that even expensive GPUs have struggled with. At low, the APU struggle in raw performance alone, but thankfully being an AMD product, we can flick on FSR and frame gen, giving about half the performance again. As you can see, even with FSR and frame gen, the 8500G had a hard time and it felt a little bit laggy. The other two felt comfortable, not buttery smooth, but certainly usable. I use the initial pirate fight to test as well, which is very intensive for particles and effects. But I'm sure if you're looking to just explore, then your FPS will be higher anyway. The last game I tested was Cyberpunk, and again, some fairly low scores, not quite touching console, but thankfully Cyberpunk's another one that supports FSR. Flicking that onto ultra performance, I saw some nice improvements, even with the 8500G pulling a respectable 54 FPS average. Now, like anything when it comes to gaming, some GPUs just do better in some titles than others, and that's certainly the case here. Clearly, though, having an FSR is a massive benefit, especially with titles like Cyberpunk, which are very intensive. I'm pretty impressed with that, not to mention great CPU scores in City Branch. In terms of heat from these CPUs, I've got a chart for that too. The 8600G and the 8700G, I did see some hot attempts, but nothing of concern, plus I'm using a stock cooler. If you're primarily doing intensive CPU tasks with this, then I recommend you get a third party cooler, just to keep the overall temps a bit lower. Out of the stack, I think the 8600G is the one that stands out for me. The 8700G with the addition of two cores and four threads is a nice thing to have, but it does bump up the price quite considerably, especially if you're going to be doing like a budget option, which I think of these are primarily aimed towards anyway. Now, as I mentioned in the start, you will be limited to a Gen 4 for your storage and also your graphics cards with these APUs. Now, just to elaborate on that a bit further, Gen 4 for your storage, wicked fast anyway, no real problems there. With the 8600G, if you use the PCI lane, you'll be limited to an X8 bus. Now, that's nothing really major in terms of real world performance, maybe a couple of frames. But if you go for the 8500G, you will go down to X4, which is the point that I'm not really a fan of and something that I wouldn't really recommend. So another point being that the 86, I think, is where it's all going to be, as that's a nice sweet spot between budget and also the features that they offer. Overall, I'd sum the 8000 series up as a nice to have option in the AM5 lineup, great for budget builds. Maybe if you're doing a media center PC or a budget living room gaming PC, future video, hint, hint, um, then there'd be a good option for that. Or if you simply just don't need a graphics card, you can save yourself quite a chunk of change uh, by not having to buy one. So I'll leave the links for these in the description box below if you want to pick one up. Of course, any more questions, do leave them down below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you, of course, to AMD and Scan for sending these out for me to look at. I will be doing some follow-ups with this as well. We might delve a little bit deeper. Maybe we can try overclocking one as well, see what happens. So if you want to see anything like that, then get subscribed and ding the bell, especially if you enjoyed this video. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.